held the relics. Christians have held the relics of saints in high regard, and Maria Theresa of Austria paid huge sum for the bones of saints. They were mostly skeletons from the catacombs in Rome. There was no proof of identity, but nonetheless, they were dressed up in satin and lace and displayed in glass coffins in her churches. Then here is a large bone in the elaborate container in the residence museum in Munich, a room which they are reluctant to show you nowadays. Such a setting has been denied the bone of Chief Maholi, killed by Kiha, King of Kauai, and made into a fly flap by Kamakahaki, later given by her daughter to the surgeon Samuel on his visit to Kauai on the discovery, March 1779. He wrote, this fly flap she disposed of for a Delft wash hand basin and a sheet. It was in Samuel's sale of 1781, then the Laverian sale in 1806, where it was bought by Bullock for four pounds. At the Bullock sale, it was bought by Wynne, then through Lord St. Oswald, it was acquired by the New Zealand government through the Te Papa Museum in Wellington, who has sent it on permanent loan to Hawaii. A treasured object with impeccable provenance, so presumably worth that large sum of four pounds in 1806. You could have bought three Hawaiian feather capes for that sum, but it's the obsession of bones that's so important. The three voyages of Captain Cook record for the first time native artifacts in the islands of the Pacific, and Sir Joseph Banks instigated the practice. He was a remarkable man with private means who took with him a botanist and an artist on that first voyage. He treated the people they met like men, not monkeys. He learned their language. He is shown here wearing a Maori cloak and with a grouped about him, a Tahitian mourner's headdress, and adds a Maori paddle and a long spear. Cook was also remarkable, not only as a good sailor, but for encouraging the people on his boat on the two subsequent voyages to collect. Anything associated with Cook provenance has a premium. This section of a spear is certainly from Hawaii, but two people must have believed the inscription engraved on the mount that it was part of a spear that killed Captain Cook. It made nearly three quarters of a million dollars when sold about 15 years ago. Ashton Lever had the largest group of objects collected by Cook in his private museum. He employed the artist Sarah Stone to record many of them. They are not totally accurate. And this basket probably no longer has its shells and looks much like another Tongan basket, but it is a guide. The sketches are to be found in various libraries around the world. A likeness can be misleading. In this portrait by Annerley of the Reverend John Williams shows him on the deck of a boat. He was a member of the London Missionary Society and discovered Rarotonga in the Cook Islands, 1823. The people embraced Christianity with enthusiasm and brought him their gods. Some were burnt on the spot. Others were sent to establish a museum in London. This included one of the largest, which doesn't look very large here, but in the London Illustrated News sketch of 1856, when the museum was re relocated, it is probably too large, but you get a better idea of its size. The British Museum bought the most important objects from the LMS in 1910. A major collection which had a great provenance was made by Lieutenant General Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers. He gave his first collection to the University of Oxford, who named the museum after him. But the ledgers of his second collection are in the Cambridge University Museum, but accessed through the Oxford Pitt Rivers website. By 1880, his cousins and elder brother had all died within a decade of each other, and he inherited a fortune, and he went shopping. The vast collection was dispersed by his grandson, George, a sad Tory I have told briefly in Provenance. This was 
part of his private museum in Wiltshire. W.D. Webster was a dealer from whom Pitt Rivers bought a quantity of stuff, not only from the catalogues he produced, but directly from, Pitt Rivers bought it directly from Webster. Thus, the catalogues are a useful guide to a Webster provenance, but not a total resource. Webster lived in Bicester, north of Oxford, which was a long journey at the turn of the last century from London. And he produced this card as a promotion for his business when he was persuaded his wife to move to London in 1900 for a two year trial. His business flourished, but his wife and daughters missed their friends. So when the two years were up, they returned to Bicester, leaving him in the hands of their friend, Ava Cutter. When Jonathan King, my co-author for the book Provenance, met the daughters, they told him that Ava Cutter had seduced their father. But the letter books in Welling Tapapa Wellington tell a different story. It's such a pity I had not read them before we published Provenance. The daughters didn't have any idea about them. Oldman was probably the greatest dealer ever. He knew Webster and has his blessing to produce those catalogues when Webster stopped in about at the end of 1901. Oldman was very successful. He had a devoted wife and no children. Much of what he sold is recorded in ledgers, of which there are copies in the British Museum RAI Library. He kept a selection of objects from Oceana for himself, and this he sold to the New Zealand government in 1948, where it was dispersed between major museums there. This photograph was taken about 1928 for publicity purposes and can be useful for identification. There are many more photographs in the very expensive book produced by Robert Hales and Kevin Conroe. Oldman had two main rivals in the sale rooms for tribal material, Harry Beasley and Walter Fuller. Beasley had private means, was able to establish a private museum. Here is a view of one of the rooms in this museum. He published a book on fish hooks and was planning another on combs when he died. At his death, his widow donated most of the collection to the British Museums and gave his ledgers to the British Museum. His labels with blue borders have minimal notations, but they can be checked against the ledgers. Although extensive, they are again not a complete list of the collection. Fuller, on the other hand, his father was a priest who encouraged his collecting, so did his wife, but he didn't have the means of Oldman or Beasley, so had to rely on luck and energy. He was passionate about his collection. He had a handicapped daughter whose future worried him, so he sold the collection of the field, to the Field Museum Chicago. The curator of that museum, seen here, Roland Force, discussed the thousands of objects with him and recorded their discussions on wax discs, which still survive in Chicago. For some reason, his library is in the Bishop Museum, Honolulu, but there seemed to be no trace of ledgers. Both these men love Pacific art, and here I come to the first pitfall. This is a fine example of a new Britain shell currency necklace in the museum in Munich, but they are making copies in Bali. They look superficially the same, but are floppy to hold. Nothing new about making copies for collectors. It seems the Maris were already producing flutes and bailers for people on Cook's second and third voyages. We know the Fijians made clubs, especially for visiting sailors. Supply and demand, as Arnie Rogoff, the bookseller, always said. Hooper had a wonderful collection, some of which he sold during his lifetime, but Christie sold seven complete or part sales for the remainder in 1976 to 1992. He died in Tested, and the British tax is cruel. Everyone should make a will to avoid that tax. However, Christie's commissioned Stephen to write a comprehensive book on his grandfather's collection and it was published under his stepfather's name of Phelps. It is a fantastic source of information, as well as establishing the provenance of many a piece. James Keggy, who had a great eye and sold some important objects, for instance, the Rabbi figure to Oldman, left no lists. 
John Hewitt on the left here was another dealer with a great eye, but who not only left no lists, but is known to have removed some provenance labels from objects. He was a good friend of Georges Ortiz, who was with him on this boat in the uh, uh, Mediterranean. He had a great eye, but could not resist a smuggled antiquity if it was beautiful. If anyone here is planning a trip to New Zealand, do go to New Plymouth to see the five storehouse panels from his collection. They are stunning. Now, back to provenance. George Bennett was sent by the London Missionary Society on a tour of inspection of the Pacific. And, after the, re and the records are in the LMS archives in SOAS, London. So we can confirm that the inscription on this stool is correct, the date. It was bought for about a thousand pounds by somebody who thought it was an Ashanti stool at a small auction in North London. Otherwise, suspicions would have been raised that this inscription would have been added. It made over a million euros at Sotheby's in Paris five years ago. There are about a dozen known examples of this type and they are beautiful. But this is a Tahitian stool of which only half a dozen are known. It is also beautiful, but it had no provenance. Found in a bungalow clearance near Bristol, a dealer bought it because he thought it might be Art Nouveau. Think of the influence of Eileen Gray and that sort of thing. Someone recognized it for what it was and sent it for sale to pay school fees. The British Museum bought it for 24,000, admittedly in 1982, but without competition from others. I still did not understand why. It's the shape of a headrest, but in fact, it is a stool a yard wide. However, provenance is not everything. The Bangwa Queen, the highest price in the sale in New York in 1966 of Helena Rubinstein's collection made $26,000. An iconic figure admired by all, it made 3 million when re-offered some 30 years later. The second highest price was tied with a fang head and is for this Bambara puppet. Taste changed and it was thought too high at the time, but it was unsold at $2,000 when it reappeared on the market. Tastes do change. But now provenance is considered so important as to be manufactured. You find a photograph of a chap in a pith helmet, a bit like this one, find a suitable name from a passenger list, have an appropriate figure carved. Alas, I cannot show you examples because I'd be sued. I'm told that such practices are used in Cameroon where they make statues from all over Africa. The Ivory Coast have been carving for the market for years, but they seem to imitate only local styles, but very well. More pitfalls. The Jerusalem Museum has an impressive collection of gold weights, many of which I examined with Bill Fagg about 30 years ago. Most of them were cast after World War I, that is to say, post the visit of Rattray, an anthropologist, who perhaps unintentionally stimulated a revival in this craft, especially figurative weights. The figure on the left is a typical example given to me by a well-wisher. That on the right was brought back to the United Kingdom by a judge in about 1900. The chair on the left was made for me by Peggy Appiah's favorite caster in Kumasi. That on the right is again from the judge. Combs and headdresses are, are th these, this is um, made for the people uh, visiting Cameroon in about 1910 for a very short time. And they can't be really classed as fakes because they're curiosities that were for made for the soldiers at that time. This again was made for presentation in the 1960s celebrations in Nigeria, and it's very finely carved, whoops. This is a, a later um, Benin casting, which is in the Munich Museum and was made by uh, the Oba. Then there's patina. 
A green cat patina can be faked for bronze and brass by leaving it in a dung heap for a month or two. For wood, a glossy black patina known as patine telephone by the French is a favorite because it's easy to produce. This in fact is a genuine mask, but this is, as I say, reasonably easy to produce. In Cameroon, they produce a more sticky patina from smoke in the rafters. The Bangor realized that the French like a good black patina and when Robert Brain passed through Paris in 1964 with his famous night mask, now in the British Museum, he returned to find the village streets full of wood chips and frenetic activity. Traditional carvings were placed above fires with plenty of coconut oil to create the black smoke for the French taste. This crusty patina on the Yorobo figure of the Delta is totally believable. A pale patina is more difficult to produce, but not impossible. The traditional methods of testing seldom work in Africa and Pacific. The plastics that were mixed in the 1950s were soon discarded and sandblasting to imitate termite erosion was similarly abandoned after about 1970. In fact, you can recreate the same by mulching papaya leaves, coating about the areas on the figure that need to be eroded and leave it in a termite nest. TL tests seldom work because the clay is too full of impurities and doesn't work at all for Western Mexico and much Peruvian pottery. The clay doesn't absorb the nutrients and whatever you release through the heat. And you cannot release something you have not captured. So to sum up, the bottom line is to look hard cross-refer your references, always keep an open mind, and really enjoy it. So, Finette, back to you. Yeah, I'm back here. Well, thank you very much. It was really, uh, really yeah, but... interesting to also to hear how they make all the patinas with the papaya oh. leaves, you said, eh? <laughs> Yes, I, I, I'm sure there are other ones that are known. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a lovely photograph, but unfortunately I couldn't get a copy, which Eberard Fisher took of this chap standing behind four big um, jars of dips. And what you did, you soaked one so that the wood went a brown, you know, brown color and wasn't and fresh and white. Mm -hmm. Then you put it in another one, um, which was a crusty pattern, and then you polished most of that off and you put it in another one. <laughs> the crust had an overlay and it was amazing. You know, he, he put, got out some masks and showed them to Bill and I, yeah. and said, which is fake made for me and which are genuine. We couldn't tell the difference. It no, was I'm sure. Um, is there anybody who wants to ask a question? So you can either raise your hand or um, or put it in the Q and A. Uh, let me know, then I can uh, unmute you. Or I have well, this is also at the beginning. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, Judy and Lane, you're right. It was too late. <laughs> um, is there anybody who wants to ask a question? Um, well, it looks like it was all clear and there are no questions. It was a really nice story. I um, would have, oh, wait, I have somebody, wait a moment. Um, okay, I have a question of Julian Lane. Uh, how can a collector arm himself when dealing with items without provenance? Have a good look and think. Go to museums if you can possibly go and go to galleries where you can handle things and always make up your own mind. Have a look at books, but remember photographs can lie. Remember the old thing that photographs never lied. We know now they can be adapted, adopted, and um, it's a, a, really impossible to tell. But if you really um, are interested, go and, uh, George Ortiz used to always lick and sniff anything he wanted to buy mm. because he said that, you know, the weight and the smell and the taste could tell you a lot. Oh. But most museums won't let you. <laughs> lick no. I don't think they want you to lick at their objects. <laughs> it is a big help if you can you know, get some of the weight. Um, yeah, uh, that's for sure. Yeah, true. You no, know, There's nothing to beat interest really be interested and think of 
what you're looking at, why you want it, why you're looking at it. And sometimes, you know, um, things that have been made in the last uh, 40 or 50 years. I mean, I'm sad I wasn't in New York to see this Maori tiki that was removed at Bonhams because it was a fake. I don't think it was a fake. They found the man who made it. That's not a fake. He made a tiki. They're yeah. still using tikis. And I would love to have seen it, especially the back, to see how it differs from the older ones that I've seen in my life. Yeah, true. Um, I also have a question of Sim Tan. Are you familiar with faking of textiles? Um, oh, I leave that to people like Tom Murray and um, oh, would, you know, sort of because they've handled so much, and I'm I'm afraid I'm very bad at all this woof and weft and waft yeah. and yeah. You know, so, I've, uh, got yeah. Textiles. I've got some textiles, but I prefer things like a good taffa cloth, where in fact you know you can see if it's painted recently or not and what yeah. kind of designs are on it. Well, um, Thomas Murray will give a lecture on Sunday, so maybe he can answer this question. Uh, I also have another question. At first, he, he or she says, thanks for the presentation. Any provenance from today's dealers that will remain in the future? Um, oh, yes. I mean, people are always quoting. I mean, right. And um, it, it, it's sort of uh, people like Jacques Cachache. But in fact, uh, I don't know. Um, Jack, I don't think he really appreciated knew his uh, and Gimio. Uh, they, they each have their area where they're specialized in, so you can trust better that area. When they venture outside into another country, they don't always like Cam Jack Cashesh accepted all those smoky Cameroon things. He went and bought them. I mean, they were made in Cameroon by the Cameroon carvers. They were patinated for the French market. Um, so, I mean, there again, it's blurry. I mean, do you call that fake or not? I mean, they were making them specifically for people like Jacques Cachache. Mm -hmm. But yet, you see, uh, and it irritated um, Tim when we sold some things for him because he estimated, um, say, a Cameroon mask, you know, the normal type which you have in a masquerade with uh, plenty of them, um, for uh, around 1,000 to 2,000. And... <laughs> Christie's were furious when he we went for 20,000 because he said he'd miss it, but it was because it was Jacques Cachache. Yeah. You know, they, they, they sort of trusted him. And he, I think, thought that they were all old because, you know, I was lucky enough to have known Robert Brain and, um, you know, you sort of, so you could really discuss things with him and, and saw the, the night mask now in the British Museum that he brought back with him. And in fact, you know, it was quite by chance I met him because it was through a friend of his who was an interior decorator, who was an old friend of mine. So there's a lot of, you know, you've got to catch whenever you can anyone that you can really discuss things with who's been in the field and is serious. Because Robert Brain was an anthropologist. Mm. Good. Um, I have another question. Um... I have seen documented old objects with cracks that look rather fresh. Any thoughts? Oh, they're poor things. They've been, the, the, this is it. The, it's very difficult, especially in the modern day, um, because it isn't just drying out that cracks would. It is um, the contrast. If you transfer from cold to hot, and that, you know, happens, you know, people put it in the attic and without realizing that it can freeze in winter and boil in summer and the water is expanding and contracting and it's very likely to crack. I mean, yeah. And it, it is, and it's very tricky because I had a, a words with um, conservationists at the British Museum and, you know, it, it sort of some people coat it in oil, but that doesn't help. It's the contrast. And if you plug it, you often wrench the cracks apart rather than bring it together. Yeah. So the thing is to try and keep uh, things at an even temperature and not also a very, very dry atmosphere. Yeah, that's difficult. Um, I have another uh, question from Kung Janssens. How would you estimate the proportion of fake uh, provenances in the market today? Can you differentiate that estimation over different type of markets, galleries versus online versus auction houses? Um, well, I'm afraid I, I don't follow. Um, I, I, I really dislike judging things from a photograph, let alone 
these grainy screens that people send you. I mean, sometimes you can, um, there's, there, there's a lot going on both in Nigeria and Cameroon, um, some gullible people being sold the treasury of the chief. But if, in fact, if you look at it, you suddenly realize it's all the sort of same hand and it's usually got this sort of crusty patina. Um, there are a couple going around. One is from Cameroon, uh, which is from some treasury of some chief there, Swadison. And the other is from the Kitty region. Um, both the gullible owners paid over a million for this group, the treasury. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know what to, you know, to tell them. Give it to some <laughs> poor university to study who then has to house it and look after it. But of course, you can't sell it to the university. You? you get a tax deduction if you can find a crooked dealer who will give you a good deduction, you know. It's a, it's a wicked world out there, and you've got to find your way around it. And um, as I say, keep an open mind, discuss as much as possible with other collectors, because in my day, it was wonderful. We, you know, John Dunn used to have these wonderful Saturday lunches with a big uh, leg of lamb and bottles of red wine. And we'd all sit around and discuss, you know, what we were buying and thinking of buying. And there were plenty of fakes around, but at least you discuss why you think they're fakes. And, and you know, often people brought objects, you know, to, to, to show and discuss around his table. Uh -huh. But now, I don't know, everyone's a bit jealous People don't in the same way. Herbert Reese always had an open house and a table. Uh, that was usually over a glass of brandy <laughs> uh, but, and coffees from next door. But, you know, you could really discuss things. But I don't know anywhere now that I can drop in and just um, find people discussing their purchases because you're not allowed to say where you got it from. You're not allowed to say what you paid for it. And, you know... It's all, a, a, it's a different world. Yeah, no, I'm no. glad, very glad to have been in our old world. In it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Oh, um, I have another question. Uh, you had registered an interview uh, regarding the fake Mumuyo figures. Can you please come back on this matter? I don't think I ever... Um, had an interview, did I? With uh, I mean, Bernard de Grun, and I haven't seen it, has published something on Memouillets. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I told, I've always told people about my visit in Nock. That would have been in 1973. Um, and at Angela Rackham, Bill Fagg's niece, uh, was up there um, doing some field work. And she took me into this room, and there were all these Memouillet figures on um racks like uh, with their feet sticking out toward us they were sort of on these shelves rows and rows of them and she said shh my quite a minute tick 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 these are the termites eating the mm. <laughs> because of course they all get eaten by termites and sadly some good old muyo figures everyone you know people filled in the termites and repatinated so, of course, it gives, it's very difficult if something's repatinated. Your eye slips all over the surface. You can't sort of get to grips with the actual figure. Yeah. I think some memories that are dismissed as figs might just be repatinated because all those termite holes have been filled. Yeah, sure. There have been plenty made for the French market. The, the, this, the Biafra War was lethal because the English have never really bought that much in figures. They like weapons, knives and spears and shields and stuff. But um, the French have always enjoyed shapes. And the Biafra War, I, I don't know if you ever went to the left bank in 1968, 69, every single shop, whether it was selling jewelry, silver, paintings, had some Ebo figures, <laughs> egghead masks and, you know, they, it, they just bought it out in shells. And then, of course, things were adapted for them. And when they ran out, they um, carved some more. Yeah, true. Um, this Pascal Alcan de Gras, who also asked you the, uh, the question before, he said, bravo for your straightforward lines on Kershaw's pieces and practice. <laughs> well, he was a rich banker's son, and that's never an easy start in life. Everyone thinks it is. But if something's too easy, you don't really have to think and dig for yourself. 
There's nothing. Go out and get those worms out of the lawn yourself. <laughs> I have one more question. Uh, there seems to be an impression that no piece produced later than about 1930 is really genuine. But when we lived in West Africa in the 1960s, many traditional ceremonies were still taking place. Do you recognize pieces from the second half of the 20th century as being genuine? Of course they are. They're still doing masquerades now. They're still making things in the traditional way. Why should we call them fake? And many of them are very lively and very, um, and they're fun to have around. I mean, I miss the Lerbs who, you know, used to send people into the field and had some relatively recent things, which were great fun. They were, um, you know, they were absolutely in the tradition. And, um, and they weren't these huge, sums of money you know you could buy them for a couple of thousand or even less no true no 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 this is uh, this is it um i was hoping to in my life but i'm now run out of steam to write with dunya hersack a book called context look at the thing judge it and put it into a context before you commit it to anything because there were revivals there were um imitations there were um you know, it, it, it isn't a black and white world out there. There's different degrees of, um, and sometimes it's enormous fun. I mean, I was um, would have loved to have had that Agoni mask, which was at Bonham's yesterday, which had a, such a wicked look and it was beautifully carved. And it went for, what, $1,500? Well, that's nothing. But, and I'm sure that could have been from the 1930s, because if you look in G.I. Jones's books, that, that's the sort of mask that they were carving and, and that sort of quality. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, Philip Espinas, you mentioned Cameroon a lot. Are any other countries notorious for potential fakes? Well, Abidjan is well known for a very long time, for nearly, it's over a hundred years. Um, and the, but the tricky thing is nobody really knows if Samir Boro realized he was selling very good copies. Nobody really knows. I tried to ask him, but of course he deflected me. He was such a nice man. I think he believed them because he wanted to believe them. They were beautiful, he wanted to sell them. Um, I think um, that the thing about the, the famous casters in Ijebu, who when they um, found that the metal for their fake coins cost more than the coins, they moved to Ogboni brasses for the Ogboni cult and the Oshogbo cult. Um, and so now in Nigeria, you get a, 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 a and these famous um, treasuries of, uh, but Cameroon was always um, very, uh, uh, Fumban uh, around there was very well known for, um, well, no, actually they, they just produced things. I don't think they really thought of themselves as fakers but in the last 20 years, um, there are things from other countries which just don't add up. And I've been told by some researchers that there are little workshops in Cameroon. And this is where you see you get this wonderful provenance of the man in the pith helmet surrounded by porters. And you choose a, a, a boat and you choose the country it went to and you, you imitate a, a figure or something from that country. Yeah. And bingo, you've got a provenance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, how to be a good collector today? Somebody asks. Um, oh, unfortunately, it's much more hard work. But you, you know, you have to do the lot. You have to do eBay, eBay Mars, um, markets, um, things like the. Occasionally, you have these sales from missionaries and things. You still can. Uh, then again, in the seventies. There was a lot, you know, the Methodist missionaries uh, closed, uh, scaled down, the Baptist missionaries scaled down. And so there were some lovely things for sale then. Um, but it is much more hard work now, much more hard work. But you, if you want to be alert, you can still find it. And as I say, make friends with collectors who will often pass something on to you if they feel that you're really interested. Yeah, true. Sure. Uh, Louis Wells, um, it's sometimes uh, useful when looking at pieces similar to what's being published, if you can see the actual piece that might have been the source of a photo used by a faker. 
Mistakes uh, are often made on the parts of the piece that are not visible in the publication. How true, <laughs> how true, they're absolutely on the nail. How true. Yeah. And then in fact, the fakers really had a field day when Christus and Sotheby started uh, photographing everything before was photographed from one angle. And then when, for instance, the, um, the famous uh, uh, horn player, the Benin horn player, that made this catastrophic sum of then 173,000. Um, they, they did I, uh, three photographs of it. And lo and behold, of course, all sorts of horn players sprouted up. Yeah. <laughs> and elsewhere. You know. um, I have another question from Philippe Di Maro. As DNA sequencing becomes more widely available, or you foresee its use in authentication ethnographic objects, People are now scraping ancient uh, parchment for evidence that Leor Leonardo inscribed them with points he had stuck in his mouth to spread color. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't heard that. Well, I must say, you know, that, that I'm so skeptical about TL. In fact, Bill, Bill used to giggle that there were sort of various little laboratories which had a, a, a screwdriver and, and then sort of lots of um, certificates. And so they make little holes and write out certificates for what they thought was appropriate from what they'd been given. And that's an easy way of making money. It's, it is very difficult. And it was Stuart Fleming who told me that it's silly to test TL, Western Mexican and Peruvian stuff, because it doesn't take on what you're releasing. So, uh, but that it's a, you know, it's a source of income for people who say they can test it. Yeah, it is difficult. Um, I have uh, one last uh, invite for you from Julian Lane. He has a Facebook group and he says, now, instead of your nicer, nice meals, that you're also invited to join a Facebook group. But I'm sure, I think you might prefer the, the nice, uh, the nice meals. And, um, and uh, also, instead of writing a new book, why don't you record video discussions on the subject, he says as well. I'm afraid I'm not good with machines, as Fenette found out. This is why I had this funny little sort of vision of myself lurking in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> I no, avoid but... anything to do with machines unless it's essential. But Fenette was kind enough to ask me to share some thoughts on provenance. And, uh, and provenance is still available. I think I've got 30 copies of anyone's passing through London. I'd happily give them one. I would definitely uh, advise people to uh, get it. Uh, um, are you still in for another question? Oh, yes. I'm... <laughs> yeah. um, because apparently I think you're right. People are would like to have meals together. If I see how many questions there are to talk about this uh, subject. Uh, will the art world ever recognize that a provenance from an African dealer can be as good as a provenance from a famous Paris dealer? Ah, oh, I think there's a bit of brainwashing going on. So that's a tricky one because it astonishes me. You know, the, the, those Mundagamore figures, the Capu one made what, one and a quarter million? And then uh, the one that Fred Backler had. And it was the same type from the same area, the same date. He couldn't even get half a million for it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think you can get, even get a quarter of a million for it because, you know, he couldn't promote it in the same way. The big auction houses do the most amazing promotions. Yeah, true. Good, good for them. I mean, they work hard at it, very hard. And they are beautiful pieces they're selling. But the difference, you know, in what they actually get for a same type of piece is, well, you know, the, the, the Christie's and Sotheby's are the two top dogs. Mm -hmm. True. Um, I have one more question from Sim Tom. Uh, do you think patterns patterns of forgery have followed similar paths across cultures at different times. For example, is Indonesian art being forged now in the same way that African uh, art has been in the past? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm Indonesia, I don't know so much, but I know that do you know, um, oh, the, the, the dry yard and the South Sea, Park, Parkinson, when he went to Bali, he said that this island is finished. This was what, 1903? Mm -hmm. um, they're all making fakes, <laughs> so, you know, and also you get all those um, Philippine spoons that were knocked out for people in, again, about 1910, 1900. And so, um, you know, there's always been a market 
for for copies of supply and demand as yeah. our Gov says yeah true yes, supply and demand and i think it'll go on it'll adapt it'll be different but i mean some of them you know um it it, it was it's it's very very difficult because i mean uh, roy Sieber rang me up one uh, and said Imani, have you really looked at that um dogon horseman that we have in washington and i said yes he said, but you know, I'm not sure I trust it. I said, I've never trusted it. <laughs> but on the other hand, it's a fabulous carving. Everyone believes it. Who am I? I'm just. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was the last question. Well, and thank you very much for this. Uh, it's obvious there is a lot of interest in this subject and you can talk about it for hours, I think. Also. Hours. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> and it is also nice to talk about it. I think it's very interesting. Yeah, very we've, we've, we've had uh, um, uh, an hour, so I think, or, or more, so, so I think that's yeah. enough. Yeah. Let's do. Okay, well, um, thank you uh, all very much also for uh, listening. Uh, tomorrow is a lecture about um, Necrest of Southern Africa, and on Sunday, uh, Thomas Murray will tell about Iban textiles. Uh -huh. and see you then. Okay, thank you, Hermani. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye bye, bye bye, everybody.